If you don't have time to read, you don't have time to write. That, according to Stephen King, who probably knows what he's talking about. He also says, because you won't have the tools to write. So what's the main message? Consume art, and not just consume it, but consume it analytically. Uh, that's the subject of today's video, uh, which is actually part eight in my video series, uh, Keys to Prolific Creation, where I talk about a bunch of different stuff that you can do to enhance your productivity as a creative person, whether you're an artist or a writer, or even a business person. And indeed, if you are an artist or a writer, you are also a business person, at least in 2017. So it's good to be able to apply these thoughts to business. Um, and I think a lot of them do apply to business. So this is one uh, consume art uh, that I particularly notice with writers um, tends to be a problem. Writers tend to go, I'm going to devote all my free time to writing my book. And then they're not reading. And they're not reading the books which inspired them to write their own book in the first place, which is kind of a weird inversion of, of how things ought to be. Um, and the thing about consuming art is that it's not just consume art passively. Like you don't want to sit down and watch a movie and just like let it wash over you and be like, okay, I did my art consumption like what Stu told me to do. Um, you need to be analyzing that art. And to me, the heart of analysis uh, is looking at what the effect is. Um, what is. What effect does the movie have upon you as a viewer or maybe upon another audience member if it doesn't have an effect upon you? Uh, does it make you happy, mad, sad, glad, scared um, throughout the work? Uh, if you're reading a book, where does it make you feel those things? And then what what elements are present that are then making you feel what you feel? And, and this includes the negative emotions, right? If you feel bored by something, what is boring you? What is missing that would interest you in whatever art you're consuming? Uh, to me, that's the heart of true analysis is looking at how... Um, the, th the elements in the work of art are actually causing an effect upon a viewer or a listener or what have you. Um, so that's where you really want to start. And through that analysis, looking at, oh, uh, the, the, the screenwriter did this with the dialogue and it made me feel this. Now you have a tool. You have a tool that you can put in your toolbox and you can pull that tool out and you can use that tool in your own art if you want to have that particular effect. Same thing with music. Oh, you know, they, you, they did this in this part of the song. You know, if I want to have a similar effect, I could do something similar in my song, um, right? And that's that's a lot of composition. In fact, that's what uh, sort of analysis is in terms of music. You look at, oh, here's Bach's chord progression he did here, and it made me feel this way. If I want to have a similar feeling to what Bach did, I can do, I can use the same chords, or I can use counterpoint the same way he used it to have the same sort of cerebral effect that he had with this. All of that, uh, all of my approach to this comes from music. Um, because I started as a musician, but it also applies to writing. Like if you look at a character and a character does a particular action, it's like, man, I didn't want him to do that. How does that make me feel as a reader? Why did the author choose to make the, the person, make the character do that? And could I do the same thing in a book if I wanted to have that similar effect on a reader? Uh, now you have a, a piece in the toolbox that you can adapt to what you're doing uh, in order to enhance your art. So the analysis portion of it is just as important as the consumption part, if not more so. Um, so when you're watching a movie, you need to not just be letting it wash over you, but looking at all the elements that are in the movie and how they're working together and, and how they're making you feel. And sometimes that may be more than one watching, uh, depending on how practiced you are at analysis. Um, but it's definitely worth your time to do that if you're a filmmaker, because you want to know what other filmmakers are doing that's successful and works and makes you as an artist uh, excited and feel, feel good, uh, or as an audience member. And you want to be able to use those things in, in your movie to make your movie as good as possible. And films in particular, like uh, this, this channel devotes a lot of time to film analysis and book analysis um, for good reason, because this eighth thing is incredibly important to what you're doing as an artist. You need to be able to have a good understanding of what is working in movies so that you can then uh, so that you can then do that. And even as a viewer, you want to know what works in movies so that you can further refine your tastes and know what movies are going to probably deliver you the experience that you want to um, want to have delivered to you. So analysis can be important to you as a um, just as a consumer as well. Um, but I devote a lot of time to it because I want to provide some of that information and get that conversation going, have people give me their input about how they felt about it and what in the movie made them feel about it. So I can draw more attention. I can think about some other element in that movie, how it worked, uh, what about the story worked or didn't work, um, what about some technical part of the movie worked or didn't work. And I really like analyzing movies. Um, 
even though I consume them less than books, because a movie has so many things going on that have to sort of be working together well to finally, you know, so many different little interlocking pieces to make that final product come out and be effective. Any sort of shortfall in any one of them can hurt the, the final product and being aware of what decisions were made where to have that effect, that's really, really important if you ever want to construct a movie or if you just want to have an understanding of that one element. Um, so for instance, if a movie is edited really, really, really tight, like there's very, very short cuts between a bunch of different little action sequences, that can make somebody feel overwhelmed or want to disengage from it. They're overstimulated. Um, and if that's the, the effect, you want to look at that and be like, okay, well, you know, clearly if you try to condense action too much, it has a bad effect. So when I edit my movie, I'm going to, I'm going to make those cuts longer so as not to overwhelm the audience member. Um, you know, that's a great lesson that you can learn from a lot of modern cinema, which tends to sometimes give you just like 20 frames of, of a particular point of view in an action sequence to give you hopefully enough information for you to understand what's going on. Maybe that's not enough information. You need to lengthen that a little bit. Or maybe you really need to cut the overall length of the movie down and shortening lots of those little things will will lead to that end. Um, or maybe there's an action sequence that isn't exciting enough and you need to look at, oh, who wrote a really exciting action sequence and what he'd do to do that? I did an analysis comparing um, the original Star Wars sort of attack on the Death Star scene to the elements of the attack on the you know, Starkiller base scene from the new Star Wars movie and how they changed. In the original one, there was uh, a lot more time devoted to like seeing characters like react to situations and really watching the action. Um, and because there was so much tension, there was so much at stake, it made the whole sequence have like this higher tension level. Um, and so taking away from that, if you were going to make another movie and it doesn't, no, it's not that you're making an attack on a Death Star scene, but you're like, I want, I want a long climactic action sequence that maintains the tension oh there was high stakes you know there was a lot of emotional reaction from from people there was failure multiple times before there was a uh, final success and there was some some element you know like when obi-wan tells luke that he has to shoot you know use the force there was some element that finally put the the impossible task just into possible to finally make uh, the the final plot goal occur right so all of those elements had to work together and then of course music right music's really important in movies if your score isn't working you can lose tension if the score is working too hard and the people start paying attention to the music then the music has failed as well there's so much going on in movies that is worth drawing your drawing your ears to drawing your eyes to um because as a filmmaker or even if you're a novelist you want to know like what could draw somebody out of a story um uh, and if you're a musician, what about this music made it stick out too much or too little, but, but buried it or what made it too prominent? You know, all of those things are important questions you should ask when you watch a movie. Um, so that's, that's it. That's pretty much part eight. Now I'm going to give you some tips for some ways that you can increase the amount of uh, consumption that you do on a daily basis. So um, a lot of people, I, I say like writers tend to abandon reading sometimes when they're writing a book because they want to devote all their free time to writing. Well, there's a lot of ways that you can get around that. And I, I feel you because my schedule is slammed. I am busy basically from the moment I wake up until the moment my head hits the pillow, I have tasks that I have to do. And I have to specifically make time to consume uh, art sometimes. Uh, and so one of the things that I do with books is that um, I try to read before I go to bed, at least even if it's just like a, a little bit, right? I read to my son when he goes to bed. So I'm consuming two different kinds of books at once. Um, I listen to audiobooks when I'm doing all kinds of tasks. If I go out and I have to fix my pool pump or something, I put on an audiobook and listen to what, uh, listen to the book. Um, which adds another element, which is delivery, which also I think is interesting, but that helps me, you know, continue to progress on a book, particularly, uh, you know, I kind of like fantasy tomes. It takes a lot of time to get through a long fantasy book. So it kind of helps if you have an audio book that can kind of, you know, help you get through the book. Um, I put on audiobooks when I'm driving places or doing errands. Um, I tend to, to sometimes listen to audiobooks when I'm doing cardio. So I do a lot of cardio. Um, so when I'm working out, I listen to audiobooks depending on, you know, what I, what I, 
what I'm feeling in the moment. As a musician, it's really easy to sort of consume music all the time. You can put music on when you're cleaning the house. You can put music on. You can do music with all that kind of stuff. You can put music on in the car. In the car, people tend to listen to lots of music. It's not the best listening environment if you're trying to hear detail, but certainly you can get through a lot of stuff if you're listening to that. Listen to music while you're working out, right? Listen to music when you're doing this, that, and the other. Music tends to be easy. So that audiobook lets you listen to music, lets you listen to the book in the same sort of environments where you would be able to consume music, which I think is great. Movies are also great for consumption and learning about stories if you don't have that much time because a movie is only like two or three hours, whereas reading a book can take a uh, much longer, you know, 10, 12, maybe 30 hours, depending on how like massive the book is. So a, a movie is a two hour experience where you can see all the elements of the story line up and fall down quickly. And that can also be a way that you do that. Um, one of the things you have to do, you know, it's it's like if you don't make time, you won't have time. If you schedule certain things like uh you know i schedule once a week to like watch a movie with my wife um and that's a little bit of time for us to not be busy doing stuff and that's also a little bit of my consumption time watch a story and, and analyze it and think about this sort of stuff um that's to me very very important now an another thing i notice sometimes visual artists to not to be out looking at art a lot. You kind of sometimes have to you we see art all around us but maybe not the art that you're really interested in looking at. So sometimes it's good to to take a few minutes a day and find those online resources like web gallery of art and just look at a bunch of paintings from whatever period you're interested in looking at and seeing what they do and how they do it. Um, even better is to try to schedule a certain amount of time to go to a museum if you're anywhere near one. I used to live in LA um, and so we had the Getty there and the Getty's a great museum if you're in Southern California for art. It's got a lot of famous paintings in it but moreover you can come up to the painting really close and you can see the paint. And seeing the paint on the painting is very different from seeing a flattened image of it because you see that the paint has three dimensions. And so you could see where details were added on top of the painting. So you might go up to a, a, like a really huge Baroque painting that has like all kinds of figures in it. And you can see like, oh, you know, the red on this belt or the red on this cape was the last thing the artist put on because you can see that that paints on top of the other paint. You can see in what order the artist tended to paint um, paint the actual painting. So getting to see a painting in, in person is just really important if you want to be a painter um, because you can see how the techniques were used where you may not have been able to witness, you know, you may not have been able to see Vermeer like paint a painting, but you could kind of ascertain the way that he did it seeing the actual paint on the canvas. Same thing like uh, we went and saw, you know, there's the irises is actually in the Getty in LA and you can go see it. It's a Vincent Van Gogh painting. And you can see that like which part of the painting he drew in and it's really interesting. It's very different from how I thought it'd be seeing a flattened image. What parts of the flower he drew last and it tends to be the, the brightest parts he put on last above all the other elements of the of the painting, um, which, which was cool. It was cool to see that. Another cool uh, thing that you can do if you are a painter is you can look up um, a lot of a lot of good artists will do sort of time lapses or like live videos of how they do studies or how they do paintings. One that I particularly like is a guy named Howard Lyon. Uh, he does magic cards. He also does a bunch of book covers that are great, um, and he also does religious like iconography kind of stuff. And it's all in a classical style. His paintings are really beautiful, but he posts a lot of videos of him constructing a painting or repeating one that he already did. So he already, you know, he already did this painting that was like this character for magic. And so he'll show him repeating the painting, like doing an iteration of it. What colors he puts on first, what colors he does next, what details he adds last until the study of the painting is complete. And then, you know, he can sell, he can sell that original. Uh, so getting to see another artist kind of do their process is really great. Um, for a musician, it's really hard um, to do anything other than look at a score or look at the at the final or listen to the final product to do a lot of uh, analysis. But if you can get any kind of extra window into how people do like production and that kind of stuff, that's very very helpful as well. Um, gives you an extra idea for how like tone is created or things like that. Uh, but luckily with music, we have a lot of scores and the score pretty much is the, is the keys to the theory that's generating it. Uh, not the performance, but once you hear this, once you understand the theory, then you can understand what performance elements get layered on top of that theory to produce the final product that you, um, that you're looking for. If you're a writer, 
the things that you're mainly going to want to analyze when you look at the books is the prose as well as the structure uh, and all the, the characterization stuff, the same that you'd listen to or watch, watch for in a movie. Um, and that's really how I do it. And that's some of the ways that I try to cram extra stuff in. Audiobooks are very helpful. Managing your time is really helpful. Having a really set schedule that includes some amount of consumption is really helpful. And the last one that I didn't mention was gaming. Gaming is something that uh, if you like games and you consider them art, as I do, um, you should make time for games. So I usually play a little bit of a game uh, whatever game I, I'm really trying to, to take in, I'll play it before bed for 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how much time I have. And then I'll read a couple pages of a book and go to bed. All right. Um, so having that time in there, I notice that really helps me wind down, helps me get to sleep faster too. That helps a lot. Um, if you are interested in being a developer, you need to be playing some games <laughs> to see what other people are doing with their games. Like, oh, here's how this person constructed this level. Here's how they approached the rendering. Uh, here's some, oh, that level of detail is, in, they, they have a really short level of detail. Hmm. Is there a way that I could not have that be noticeable when I program my 3D game? Uh, all of those are, are really good things to take in when you're, uh, when you're doing a, a development. And likewise, like a movie, a game has so many elements that have to be going for it for it to be like really functional and really effective. Um, and when you find a game that does those things really effectively, um, you should take it in and see what they're doing. Uh, and even if you're not a, a game developer, you could you could analyze the game to see uh, how it had an effect and see if that's applicable to your art. Um, so hopefully all of that is really, really helpful, helpful, uh, helpful for you. And um, please do like, comment, and subscribe and let me know what you want to see in here down below. I am actually going to add a number nine onto this, so stay tuned for that. Um, likewise, I also have my own art coming out uh, on Halloween that you can buy. Here it is. Uh, this is the physical uh, Zool, Memories Adrift, uh, David V. Stewart Zool. This is my album. Um, the physical came out pretty cool, so I hope you will uh, take a look at it at zoolonline.com. And if you like the music, maybe give it a listen. Uh, listen to it on whatever streaming service you like if you want to do that. And if you want to buy uh, high-quality 24-bit audio files, zoolonline.bandcap.com. And uh, this is what the, the physical packaging looks like if you want the physical, um, which I designed myself, by the way, talking about talent stacking. All of this, all of these visual things were done by me, including the rendering of the planets was also done by me. So um, you guys have a good one. I will see you next time and good luck on your projects.